Welcome to Food for Thought. My name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau from Compassionate Cooks. I founded Compassionate Cooks to empower people, to make informed food choices, and to debunk myths about vegetarianism and animal rights. You can learn more about who we are and what we do by visiting our website, www.compassionatecooks.com. Hello, everybody. It's good to be here. First of all, before we get started, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Krista Hidema. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Krista, one of our Canadian listeners, Krista wrote, I am so truly grateful for your podcast. Thank you sincerely and deeply. Your podcast speaks to me and I'm so very grateful, not only for the knowledge you provide, but also for the kinship. I found you a few months ago after having avoided the iPod world for so long. Then one of my clients gifted me with an iPod and the very best part of joining the iPod culture was your podcast. I'm a long time vegetarian vegetarian 20 plus years and recent vegan who read diet for a numerica one day and that was that one of your podcasts that I found particularly touching was the one on teen college age vegetarians and I remember distinctly that I saw the topic line and I thought to myself that I would not likely listen as it did not seem relevant to me then I was cooking in the kitchen one day and I put it on. There were two stories that literally moved me to tears. The first was the young girl whose parents would not buy her vegetarian food and who went to sleep at night while hugging her dog and listening to your podcast. The second was the story of the teenager whose parents were aghast at their vegetarian son, yet understanding of their smoking son. After 20 plus years of being vegetarian, my mother thinks it's still a fad and still doesn't understand. Thank you again. I will continue to listen, to learn, and to live in accordance with what I believe and feel and know. I'll include another excerpt from Krista's very sweet email below, but I wanted to share at least that much with you to show you how much your words that you send to me move other listeners. That's why I read what you send to me. There's no sense keeping them locked up in my own brain, in my own inbox. All of you are creating a ripple effect that's felt far and wide, even all the way to Canada. Amazing. So thank you so much, Krista. I've enjoyed our brief correspondence and I'm going to take you up on that offer to visit you in Toronto one of these days. So be careful what you wish for. Uh, Krista's sponsorship literally helps me keep this podcast going and I'm very grateful to her. If you would like to support this form of outreach, please consider sponsoring the podcast either with a one-time contribution or with a monthly sponsorship. Every amount helps. So thank you for individually and collectively making this podcast possible. In part one, I talked about the importance of perceiving non-vegetarians as blind locked vegetarians to help us cope in mixed relationships, mixed relationships being those between vegetarians and vegans and non-vegetarians. And of course, the relationships to which I'm referring are not just romantic. Mixed relationships include those between friends, co-workers, family members, and most certainly between parents and children. I've been getting a lot of requests from newly vegetarian or newly vegan parents who want to help transition their meat-eating children and are looking for specific books and films and suggestions. So just know that's definitely on my radar screen. But it's often the teenager or adult vegetarian who struggles with the parents' meat-eating and lack of support. So that's mainly who I'm referring to here when I refer to parents and children. And I'll certainly talk more about this in another episode dedicated dedicated to teen vegetarians. In this episode, part two of Living Among Meat Eaters, I want to offer some very specific suggestions for effectively coping with a non-vegetarian partner or family member, friend, etc. As the newly awakened vegan, we're often anxious to spread the word, and it's totally normal. You want to share your enthusiasm with people you care about, not just because you're excited about your own new way of seeing the world, but also because it has ramifications for your your loved ones, both physical and spiritual. But many people can feel like Cassandra when expressing their enthusiasm as well as their newfound knowledge. You remember Cassandra from Greek mythology. She was the beautiful daughter of Priam and Hecuba of Troy, and she was cursed with the gift of prophecy. Cursed because with that gift came the curse that nobody would believe her. And I know many of us can feel that way sometimes. And if you think I'm calling you all prophets, well, perhaps I am. The word prophet 
comes from the Greek word, uh, which means to speak. A prophet literally just tells what's true, both in the present and in the future. A prophet is a messenger of truth with the purpose of initiating social change. And as we know, most prophets are not received with open arms because they're often bringing bad news, bad news that people need to hear in order to make change. So Cassandra was cursed with telling the truth that no one would believe. There's a short little contemporary play written about Cassandra, and there's some dialogue between Cassandra and her nephew and Tyanax that I think exemplifies what we experience. Um, and I just wanted to share a little bit of it with you. Cassandra tells Antionax why she's so tormented by knowing the future and being branded as a madwoman and a liar by those who don't believe her, which is pretty much everyone. He says, I believe you. And Cassandra says, and you are an eight-year-old child whose perceptions are dismissed as readily as are my own. But adults with the power to transform reality are deaf to my cries. They mock me, laugh at me, accuse me of having fantastic visions. I am a prophet without honor in my own country. And Antionax says, if your powers of perception are such a burden to you, then why do you interpret the signs of nature which enable you to see the future? Why not simply blind yourself to their significance? And Cassandra says, knowledge is not like that. Once you have acquired it or have the possibility of acquiring it, human beings are compelled by their own natures to bring it to fruition. Since the days of Prometheus, when fire excited our collective imaginations, we have lusted for knowledge. We cannot refuse to understand. We cannot forget what we already no. When a new way of doing things is developed, we may wish that it could be undiscovered, but that is a fantasy and a lie. Rather, we must operate in a world in which this new understanding exists to use it for good purposes and to corral its ability to foment evil. And I think a lot of us can relate to the idea that once you know the truth about what happens to the animals, and once you gain a deeper understanding of our connectedness to everything that happens, there is no turning back. But more than that, you want to change what's happening. You want to fix it. You want to transform the world, which is why you want to tell others about what you've become awakened to, about what you've learned. And I've said before that I believe that intentions are everything. They determine our thoughts and our actions and help us to stay clear about what we're trying to get out of every situation. When one person in a relationship becomes vegan, it doesn't necessarily follow that the other person will jump on board. Sometimes they do right away. And so this is obviously not for you, <laughs> but sometimes they don't. Uh, the, the bottom line is, as Cassandra Sandra understood, we can't not share the truth because we might not get a favorable response to it. Just because people may be skeptical about the information you share doesn't mean you don't share it. This is where the idea of intention comes in. I believe we talked about this in greater detail in the podcast episode called Speaking Your Truth, but I'll just say again that being clear about what your intentions are every time you speak for the animals for the truth will make you an effective advocate 100% of the time. When your intention is to just tell the truth but remain unattached to the outcome, you can't but succeed every time because anything that stems from your truth-telling will be a bonus. Any flower that grows from the seeds you plant is a bonus. You don't set out to create a flower. You set out to plant seeds. A flower doesn't need your help becoming a flower. It knows what to do, but you have to plant the seeds first. So in our mixed relationships, it's so important to stay clear about our intentions. So for instance, when we talk about what the animals endure, do we do it to make the other person feel bad? Do we do it to make the other person feel guilty? Or are we doing it in such a way that we simply want to tell the truth? Do we make snide or ungracious comments to our partners when they eat a chicken sandwich, chastising them for their hypocrisy for loving the family dog but not caring about chickens? I mean, do we do that? You know, do we do these kinds of things? This kind of passive aggressive or even just aggressive aggressive response? Now, that's not to say that 
this isn't a conversation you can't have with your partner. You know, let's talk about the difference. Why do we have a different perception about our dogs or our cats or our rabbits or whoever it is we share our homes with and a different perception between, you know, those animals and the animals that we raise and kill for food. So these are important discussions to have, but there really is a difference between having a thoughtful conversation where you're both engaged and one where you're attacking the other for his his or her lack of consciousness. And I think that we always have to just check ourselves and be really honest with ourselves about what our intentions are. Some of you may have heard me say before that when I set out to do my work, my intention is not to make the world vegan. My intention is not to change someone's mind. If those were my intentions, I believe I would fail every time. It's not my role to make anyone do anything. All I can do is speak the truth and trust that that truth will inspire others to act on their own values. That's why I don't like the word convert. I prefer inspire. I prefer empower. I never set out to convert anyone. When I set out to speak on behalf of animals in my mind, I make sure that I'm clear about this intention before I teach a class, before I record a podcast episode, or even answer someone's question on a one-to-one -one basis. I make sure in my mind that I'm clear about my goal. And my goal is to raise awareness about the suffering of animals, to be their voice, and to speak my truth. That's it. I believe we're all here to be teachers for one another. That's what I believe. And I'm grateful for my role as a conduit, but that's all any of us are. That's why if we don't speak our truth, we're not only falsely representing who we are and what we believe, but we're also denying someone else their own transformation. I believe intention is everything and people individually and collectively are smart enough to see right through you if you appear false to them, if you appear to have a hidden agenda, you know, in other words, if you are saying one thing, but you really mean another, having a clear intention about your goal and making that goal about truth rather than outcome will, as I said, make you a successful, effective advocate 100% of the time, 100% of the time. Because all we can do is plant seeds. I mean, all I can do is plant seeds and have no attachment to the outcome. If I were to approach someone in such a way that my agenda was to make them change their minds or to make them become vegan, right, or stop eating animals or something very like, much based on outcome, not only am I putting an awful lot of pressure on myself, I also don't think it's very effective. People tend to push back when they feel dictated to, especially those who are closest to us, especially those who are older than us, i.e. our parents. So unfortunately, the game plan often backfires. And the result is I walk away feeling frustrated, like I failed, like I didn't attain my goal. Well, yeah, because that's a pretty lofty goal to get someone to change their thinking and change their behavior just because of one conversation with me. I also think it's just a little error again too. But look at the difference. I approach someone, anyone, I don't care who it is, but if I approach anyone with my intention, my intention being to raise awareness about what happens to the animals and re removing myself from these facts, by the way, this is about the animals. This is not about me. My intention is also to speak my truth. And so if someone asks me why I'm vegan, I tell my truth. I tell my story, my reason for being vegan, which is, in short, to not contribute to suffering and violence where I have the power to do so. Nobody can take away my story. Nobody can take away your story. Nobody can say, that's wrong, that's not true. So if my intention is to raise awareness for animals, be their voice, and speak my truth, my intention will always be met. My goal will always be met. My goal will always be accomplished because I didn't set out to do anything other than tell the truth. And I may have planted some seeds along the way, but now I walk away feeling true to myself, true to the animals, and hopeful that the seeds I plant may be watered and nurtured and tended by someone else that will encourage the growth of those seeds and manifest itself in such a way that that person will also experience transformation. So, that's the first thing I want to say is I think it's really important to be clear about your intention. So first create your own intention, create your intention and be clear and consistent. So just so we're clear, B 
being clear about your intention doesn't mean you remain silent. I hope that makes sense, right? All of this is the art of finding the balance between speaking your truth and staying humble. The word humility is gravely misunderstood in our society. Often it's confused with humiliation, which though it shares the same root, humus, meaning of the earth, right? Humus, which is the um, layer of the of the soil. It's very different. The problem is that some people think being humble is humiliating. To have humility, to be humble, is to be without arrogance. Arrogance is what we risk if we forget our own stories. If we forget that we too were once asleep to the truth, then we may become arrogant. If we forget that we too had our own blocks, made our own excuses, didn't want to know what happened to the animals, didn't want to take responsibility for our role in the suffering of animals, then we risk arrogance, which makes us very unpleasant people to live with. Being humble, remembering our stories, means that we find places in conversation and interaction where we can relate. So when someone says, I don't want to know, I don't want to know what happens to the animals, Instead of saying something like, how can you be so close-minded or why do you have to be so selfish or something more passive aggressive or, or whatever, we might say something like, you know, you know, so someone, so, so someone says, you know, I, you know, I don't want to know what happens to the animals. We might say something like, I know what you mean. It's really painful. I had the same reaction you did or I can really identify with that. I said the same thing for years before I finally changed my mind. Or instead of trying to have all the right answers, you could actually ask questions. You know, you can say things like, I know, I hear you. You say you don't want to hear about what happens to the animals. What do you think will happen? What do you think will happen if you find out? And I have a nagging suspicion that I've heard that last suggestion before, and I think I heard it from my friend Ray Sakura. So Ray, if you're listening, I just want you to know I'm giving you props for that. I think I've heard you suggest it, and I love it. So I'm just taking it and borrowing it right now for this purpose. But it's a great suggestion. We don't always have to have the answers. We can ask the questions back so we can, again, have a dialogue. And that's what this process is about. It's about engaging people and having a dialogue and communicating and being open and being honest. All of these things that just make you know pleasant relationships. Being humble means keeping ourselves and our stuff and our anxiety and our fear and our anger out of it. It doesn't mean we don't have fear that things will never change. It doesn't mean we won't have anxiety that this person won't change or anger that things are the way they are. But if we want to be effective, we have to let our compassion guide us and not any of these other things. It's our compassion that compels us to our wakefulness and it's compassion that will awaken others to theirs. If we're pushy or hostile or angry or passive aggressive or self-righteous or arrogant, I just don't think we're going to be very effective. People can be very defensive around this issue. So it's like their dukes are already up and they're wanting a fight. They're expecting a fight, especially if it's a loved one who feels you want to change them. You want to be a safe place for them. You don't want to be a place where they feel threatened or judged. But again, it's walking that line of being humble, but also speaking your truth, finding ways to speak the truth, even if it rocks the boat. And frankly, I've always been a boat rocker, so I'm proud of that, and I could never be anything but, and my husband tells me he wouldn't have it any other way. So just to be clear, being humble doesn't mean being self-effacing, and you can check out the Speaking Your Truth episode for more about that. So again, it's always walking this line of, 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 of respect for yourself and for the person you're talking to. I mentioned the idea of removing yourself from the equation so the conversation doesn't become a battle between you and your partner or you and your friend or your parent or whoever it is. And one aspect of that is just sticking to your truth. But it also means giving people the information they can check out themselves. In my mission statement, I use the word empower very purposefully. The mission of Compassionate Cooks is to empower people to make informed food choices. And I use that very, very carefully, very intentionally. I always say that I don't want people to take my word for it. I want them to understand this stuff for themselves. And whether someone's interested in eliminating meat, dairy, and eggs from their diet for health, ethical, or environmental reasons, the facts are all out there for people to see. And it's helpful for them to see it with their own eyes. 
And though I think it's perfectly fine to be the one to introduce your loved ones to this information, I think it's helpful to be humble when doling it out. Note the difference between you really need to read this or you should read this, right? And, you know, some things you said recently indicated that you might be interested in answers to some of your questions. I read this book and I was really amazed and inspired by what I discovered. I thought you might like it too. I mean, you know, find ways to, again, find this kind of common ground. And you could say things like, I thought you might want to read this book. I would love to talk to you about it. I would love to get your perspective on this, right? Big difference between that and, uh, you know, like, even though you said you didn't want to look, I really think you should. If you just open your mind, you might learn something. You know, obviously, <laughs> obviously there are ways to go about this, but I know that it can be really emotional. I know it's really tempting to just get emotional about this as opposed to just finding common ground. And this applies to giving people information re regarding the health or ethical aspects, you know, buying books for family members or partners or friends, sending them websites, forwarding them articles. It, I think it's all perfectly fine asking them to listen to this podcast. The key is just to do it in a way that, again, you're presenting information, but you don't have an attachment to the outcome. Now, it's worth saying that some people may not want the information from you because it's from you. And though I've been so impressed with the emails I've received from parents who've been influenced and inspired by their children, both their teen children and their adult children, I don't think it's the norm. I think family members, i.e. parents, can be the hardest to reach because of all the other underlying dynamics that are already built into these relationships. But they might hear the same information from some stranger and they take it to heart. This is my case, at least. I mean, I could say to my parents, I, you know, like, you know, you really ought to eat more vegetables. And they'll be like, yeah, like we eat enough vegetables. So, but thank you. And then like the plumber will say like, you know, I heard it's really good to eat vegetables and they'll believe him. And then they'll come to me and be like, you know, I heard it was really, like really good to eat vegetables. And I'll be like, no, really? That's amazing. Wow. Really good advice. So <laughs> they don't want to hear it from me. They don't want to hear it from me, literally. So, so just so you know that frankly, some people don't want to hear it just because it's coming from you. And that doesn't mean you can't, you know, leave literature around the house uh, that they might happen to pick up um, or books in the bathroom. Uh, get, getting magazine subscriptions for them is a great way to give them information because it's a gift you think they'd be interested in, um, even though you gave the magazine to them. At least they're getting information through that magazine from another source, you know, from, from the people in the magazine. There's also something to be said for getting getting something published, even if it's a letter to the editor. I mean, I could say all the same stuff to some people like my parents or my in-laws until I'm blue in the face. But once it's in print, once it's in black and white, now it has weight, right? If a magazine or a newspaper prints what I have to say, then it must be worth listening to. So, you know, that's what's really interesting is my parents or my in-laws would get really excited when I have something published. And it's like, the, it, it's valid, right? There's like validity to what I have to say, but I could be saying the same stuff for years and they like never listen. So to answer your question, no, neither of my parents or David's parents are vegetarian. Though they're very supportive, they all still eat animals. What can I say? I think family is the hardest. I do think family is really the hardest. And sometimes you just have to let go. This leads me to the next suggestion I have for living with non-vegetarians. Cook. Remember my motto, if it's good, they will eat it. That's the bottom line. If it tastes good, they will eat it. You do not have to become a gourmet cook, but food more than anything else will change people's minds about this crazy vegan thing. And it could even strengthen relationships too. Check out this email I received from Richard in Washington, D.C. Here's what he has to say. Quote, Long story short, I have been meat-free since Thanksgiving 2005, though my wife has not changed her diet. So when just a few months before my 30th birthday, I made a decision to go cold turkey, pun intended, my Midwestern wife cried. She's gone through tremendous sacrifices by buying different food, learning new recipes, keeping little to no meat in the house, spotting meat-free dishes on restaurant menus, etc. My initial revelation to her was that since age 16, I have felt guilty eating meat. But she felt, what would dinner be? She grew up with three primary food groups, meat, potatoes, and a side dish. How does a side dish become the main course? Well, 
Since then, the benefits have been tremendous. Our former evenings had us on separate schedules. She would cook alone. We would eat together. I would clean alone. We both felt bitter for not having help from the other while doing our respective chores. Well, since I became vegetarian, her one requirement was that she would cook meatless dishes if we would do it together. And we have. It's shortened the evening schedule. We have more time. We have more time together. We buy whole foods and have expanded into more international foods from Indian samosas to Central American spicy black beans. And though she still eats meat, her support has removed any burden from my decision. Isn't that just lovely. I love that. It's such a great example of how food brings us together. The kitchen is still the hearth of the home. It always has been. It always will be because in the kitchen, we can nurture each other and nourish each other and stimulate all of our senses. It's the room in the house that most everyone congregates in when they come over. So just make use of that time cook together, prep together, talk about the meals you want to share together, and then share them together. My favorite moments with David are sitting down at our dining room table and sharing a meal together. And that boy has a meal waiting for him every night. Well, almost every night. Some night he has band practice and I teach some nights, but every night that boy has dinner waiting for him when he gets home. And it's just really wonderful. And of course, we also love, well, I love entertaining. <laughs> David does too, but yeah. Anyway, and of course, we love to have friends over. So we love sharing meals. It's just wonderful to just sit down and actually share meals together in the home. So if you can share time together in the kitchen, great. If you can't and you're the vegetarian in the house, cook. That's why I do what I do, teaching cooking classes to get people back into the kitchen, eating healthfully and eating compassionately without feeling they have to dedicate all their time to it. It doesn't take that long. And if you think 30 minutes total, you know, in the kitchen, preparing meals for one another and for your family is too long, then perhaps it's time to start reprioritizing things. Taking 20 or 30 minutes a day to create healthful meals for each other should be a priority. If it tastes good, they will eat it. Bottom line. Here's an email from Joanna that exemplifies this. Quote, my husband was gung-ho for giving up meat, eggs, and milk, but it was still a cheese-crazed maniac. And he told me he couldn't go vegan because of it. Well, I made him a vegan version of fettuccine Alfredo, and I'm proud to say he gave up cheese permanently. We finally went through our pantry last weekend and discovered that we still had tons of food that either had animal products or meat in them. So we packed it up and gave it away. It was like a cleansing ritual. The feeling now while I'm digging through my pantry isn't, oh, I hope this doesn't have animal byproducts in it. It's now, what do I want to eat? And it's nice to finally have my house as my safety. I can eat whatever I want that's in my house. I love it. It's like the difference between eating in a vegan restaurant, right, where everything is yours to choose from versus eating in a non-vegetarian restaurant where the options are fewer. And I think I said before that we do have a vegan household. Only live animals are allowed in our house. Okay, some live animals are not allowed and we carefully escort any uninvited insects out into um, the outside. But no dead animals or secretions from animals are allowed in our house. And I'm very grateful that David agreed to do this before he was vegan. I sat him down and I told him how painful it was for me to have any of that stuff in the house. And I asked him if he would be okay honoring my request for having a vegan house. And he was more than happy to oblige. In fact, I'm sure it's one of those things that made it easier for him when he did become vegan not very long after that. So that's something to consider. You know, sit down, tell your partner what being vegan or your parent means to you that being around animal exploitation products is painful and that you would feel so much better if your house could be meat, dairy, and egg free. I've seen it time and time again that the partner agrees, winds up eating that stuff outside the house, the animal products, but because at home he or she is eating only healthful plant-based foods, they wind up eating fewer and fewer animal products even outside of the house. I've received a number of emails that talk about this and I hear from people all the time who, who, who talk about this. One email is from Natalie who wrote, 
I am a lone vegetarian in our family and group of friends. I should add, my husband is very supportive, and this year he's been eating less meat and liking it. I was so surprised the other day when he told me that the last two times he had steak, he didn't like it. He actually wants to have veggie skewers with no meat. I couldn't believe it, right? So that's an example. I mean, it really surprises the person who's on the other side. Or Sherry, a relatively new vegetarian who just wrote to me the other day to tell me that her husband has really been enjoying all the vegetarian meals she's been serving and is even requesting vegan cheese. And he's been requesting better and more creative tofu and tempeh based meals. Okay. Or Craig, I loved Craig's email. Craig told me that he told me that since he's transitioned to veganism, he's not only felt better emotionally and physically, he's also become a better cook. He wrote, quote, my wife, Stephanie, uh, was still eating fish when we met five years ago. My cooking was able to turn her because every time we'd meet for food, I'd offer to cook. After a while, she adopted it on her own and is now trying to go vegan with me. And Krista, today's wonderful sponsor, also told me, I don't have any vegetarian friends, but I do have a wonderful, loving, and supportive husband who is en route to being vegetarian. I've decided to tread carefully and not to push or preach. Instead, I share, educate, and encourage. See, like Krista could have written this particular podcast. That's exactly the kind of thing um, that is so much more effective. Anyway, she says, he's so respectful of me. We keep a vegan home and he's so open to eating anything and everything I make. I couldn't imagine being any more fortunate or feeling any more loved and respected for my choices. And that's all from the power of cooking and from living our truth and from just the power of being the vegan in the relationship. It's powerful, contagious stuff. So I call that you know being the vegan in the room. It's a very powerful position to be in. That's why I think it's so powerful to state I'm vegan. You're you're not simply saying I eat vegetables. You're physically representing. You're fully manifesting a conscious life, an awakened mind and heart, and people feel it. People know it. That's why they'd rather you just kept it to yourself. Because they they know the power of that. But it's such a gift to them to be truthful. It's an homage to the animals to be truthful. And it just feels so good to be proud about being a joyful vegan. And yes, you will be the one they come to with all of their questions. Light attracts light. So just get used to it. Once you speak your truth, it will attract others who want to speak theirs. Now, in some relationships, it may be a different story. The non-vegetarian partner may not make any change at all, though I doubt it will last. I really doubt that will last unless there are some other really unresolvable issues in your relationship. Most partners eventually make some sort of shift. But if that's the case, if you are in such a situation where your non-vegetarian partner is not making any shifts at all, just please try not to take it personally. As much as we each have our own process and transition, we also have to honor the transition and the process in the people around us. You know, they have their own process. And it's also important, I've said this before, that we have to really be clear about where we end and another person begins. As much as we're joining in partnership with the people around us, we're all individuals too. So we have to be really clear about their own processes. Even though we may have completely changed and have completely awakened, we may forget to look at how our changes affect our, our relationship, affect our partner. In any relationship, I don't care what the reason is, when one person changes for whatever reason, it changes the dynamic in the relationship. And who knows, it might even bring some deeper issues up to the surface that need to be addressed, and some may be fixable and some may not. But just be easy on yourself and be authentic in any encounter you have. You may not always know the right thing to say, which is why the truth is always the best thing. And if your truth comes out in such a way that you might not sound like a guru, you know, just be easy on yourself. Ask yourself if you did the best you could. Ask yourself if your intentions were pure. 
if you would do it differently next time, then just do so. Just speak your truth and the truth, but try not to feel like you have all this pressure to do it the right way every time. Plant your seeds. That's all you can do. There are definitely times when I wish I had said something different or I wish I had said something better or you know, sounded wiser or less emotional or whatever. But, you know, when I've had the opportunity to follow up, I have. And if I haven't had the opportunity to follow up, it's just the way it is. I have to let it go. You know, you're not perfect. It's not about being perfect. It's about doing the best you can. It's about speaking your truth. I know there are some advocates who suggest that we don't discuss animal rights or veganism when people are eating. Rather, when people ask us over dinner, if we're eating with non-vegetarians, that is why we're vegan, that you know, some people suggest we just say, you know, this is kind of a difficult time to talk about it while you're eating meat. Let's just talk about it later. And though I think there's something to it, I think being able to read the situation is helpful at that moment. If there's hostility in the question, perhaps it is better to say something like, why don't we discuss it after we're all finished eating? But I don't know. I, I, if someone asks me that question while we're eating, I would want to answer it truthfully. But again, I just need to be clear about my intention and my truth. If I want to answer it just to make the people eating meat feel bad and come off as the self-righteous one, then I don't agree that that's the right thing to do. But I just don't like the idea of losing the opportunity to have a dialogue about this issue because it might not come up again later and it might feel kind of contrived and awkward to bring it up later. Have I mentioned that being clear about your own truth about why you don't eat animals is really important? I, I know I keep repeating myself, but clearly I feel strongly about it. It just takes the pressure off. It just takes the pressure off of thinking that you have to have all the answers or know all the statistics or be a freaking heart surgeon to be taken seriously. I know some of you have heard me say that it can be frustrating to have the responsibility of being the vegan in the room because everyone expects you to have all the answers and that you figured it all out, that you have advanced degrees in philosophy and nutrition and anthropology and animal husbandry and the culinary arts, right? They just expect you to have all these answers. But when you just tell your story, when you just tell your truth, nobody can tell you that you're wrong. I got a wonderful email from a young woman named Claudia who wrote the following. She's so cute. So the other night I was eating out with some family members and friends I hadn't seen in a while when someone asked me why I didn't eat meat. This was over dinner. It was almost like everyone put down their forks and knives and waited for my response. My answer was, I don't eat animals because I don't want to support the industries that create unnecessary waste and suffering, regularly abuse the rights of humans and animals, and use their money to change laws in their favor. I don't eat animals because I don't need to. I think the question should be, why do you eat meat? So, I mean, you know, people can take it. People are asking the question. I think they can, I think they can take it. I think we just have to, you know, feel the situation out and, and be really honest and, and be really clear. So finally, I am so desperate to get back to a project I started a couple years ago called the 30 day vegetarian challenge. Like everything I do, it's vegan, but I'm using vegetarian as an umbrella term. Anyway, I'm just so swamped with everything else. And, and yet I think this is going to be an incredibly effective and helpful project for people. The idea behind it is that I believe that people make the practical changes with great ease when they have the resources they need to make it easier for them. People want to succeed. They don't want to fail. And the 30 day challenge would provide daily weekly and just full on regular support for people who commit to making the transition for 30 days to, to doing it for 30 days. It's not just a pledge they make. It would literally hold their hands through the process. And if you're interested in helping me fund this, just let me know. This was certainly one of the barriers to this, to this project, to most of the things I do, frankly, <laughs> it's just, I don't have funding for it. The point is, I think most people don't know how much meat and dairy and eggs they eat until they stop eating them. Everyone says, I don't eat a lot of meat or I don't eat a lot of cheese or whatever, but they don't really know how much they eat until they stop. I usually say, well, then great. It'll be really easy to let go of the remaining animal products you are eating. It'll just be a breeze. So... While I build this humongous project, the 30-Day Vegetarian Challenge, I just want to offer that as my final suggestion. If your partner or your friend or parent or child or whomever is willing to do it, ask them to try it for 30 
days. We can all do anything for 30 days. 30 days is not a long time. It's like it's like when people have weddings and, and the par- my parents did, you know, kind of said, well, you know, why would you want to have a vegan wedding? That seems kind of disrespectful for the people who are not vegan. You should have some things for them to eat. And I said, but everybody can eat vegan. Everybody can eat everything that we have, but I'm certainly not going to have animal products there. You know, well, maybe you could have this. And I said, you know, look, it's one meal. It's one day. If people can't go without meat for one meal, then they have a bigger problem, right? So same thing with 30 days is not that long. And I think people really like the idea of, of having a challenge like that. So ask your ask your loved ones if they'll do it for 30 days. We can do anything for 30 days. And if we can't, I really do think there's a bigger problem. So I hope some of these things helped you. Certainly let me know if you have more questions on this topic. We'll certainly cover other elements to this issue in, in other ways. And like I said, we'll talk more about teens and vegetarianism. So so take care and may your daily choices be a reflection of your deepest values. This is Colleen from Compassionate Cooks. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.